All right, back from break. So um, we were just taking a look at this water barometer that is 10 meters high, and someone up here has to be able to look out and see, maybe get some um, binoculars, and uh, see how high the, the water level is today. Uh, the higher level indicates a higher uh, atmospheric pressure. All right, let's move on and take a look at some other very important items here. Maybe the most important uh, feature of the uh, chapter is taking a look at buoyant forces. Now, you guys are familiar that some materials will float in, in water, for example, or some other fluid. Uh, other materials are below the surface, but what we find is there's still what we call a buoyant effect. So if something is down inside the fluid, that object is experiencing a larger force from below compared with the force from above. We already went in and calculated this and showed that the difference in the force from below and above is given by the density of the fluid times the gravitational field times the cross-sectional area times the difference in heights. Now, the area times that height is the volume of the displaced fluid. So the buoyant force can be this, this net effect of fluid pressure creates what we call the buoyant force. So uh, now I'm, I'm having a buoyant force exerted on me right now due to air pressure. So the air pressure lower down at my feet is higher than the air pressure at my head. Now I can go through and I can use this formula to figure out how much buoyant force I'm getting, it's not much. So it's a pretty small amount. But if we do the same calculation with water, for example, we'll get a much more significant buoyant effect. Again, water is 800 times denser. It's going to create 800 times the buoyancy. So the buoyant force then can be written as density of a fluid times the volume of the fluid being displaced times the gravitational field. Now what that also means is that the buoyant force can be written as the mass of the fluid uh, displaced uh, times g. Now, um, yeah, so this is saying kind of the same thing here. It's saying that there's going to be a buoyant force. It's a result of the pressure below the object being higher than the pressure above. The pressure along the sides tends to cancel out. So it's how much upward force do we have minus how much downward force do the fluid. Uh, and that gives us an upward effect. Okay, here is a statue that's submerged. It's, ooh, it's Archimedes. Uh, and so what we can do is we can draw a force diagram. Now, in the force diagram, we've got mg, which is the gravitational force. So the gravitational force uh, operates down in the water. Um, I recently watched the new Pixar movie, which I thought was excellent, Luca, uh, and it was about some sea, some ocean creatures. And uh, they kind of hinted at one part in the movie that when you're below the water, gravity goes away. So I wasn't sure what to make of that. Uh, there definitely is, is uh, still a gravitational force um, acting on these objects. Uh, the objects are down in the water. Yes, the gravitational force is still there. Now what does happen is you end up with a buoyant force. And for you know, biological organisms, uh, the buoyant force, because you know, biological organisms tend to have the same density as water, the buoyant force matches very closely the gravitational force. So those two forces offset. So it's not that gravity is going away, it's that the uh, buoyant force is offsetting gravity pretty much. It's pretty much balancing gravity for anything made out of biological materials. Okay. Um, all right, so here is this statue. Now, there's not enough buoyant force here to float it to the surface, but we're going to lift it. And the question becomes, uh, it says it uh, has a volume of 30,000 cubic centimeters, and uh, it's a 70 kilogram ancient statue. Ooh, it's an ancient statue. 
All right, so here's what it looks like. Here is the ancient statue. It's got some mass, that's 70 kilograms. Here's the rest of my force diagram. We've got a gravitational force. Yes, gravity still operates under the sea, so, or under the ocean. Uh, so this is mg. We're going to lift this up with some tension, but we're going to get some help from the buoyant force. So let's set this up. So the buoyant force depends on the density of the surrounding fluid. It depends on the volume, specifically the volume of the fluid that has been pushed aside. We call that the displaced volume. The volume of fluid that's been moved out of the way uh, in this case would be the volume of the object. So the volume of missing fluid is the 30,000 cubic centimeters, which works out to be 0 0.0300 cubic meters. So that's the volume of fluid. Now the density of ocean water is 1,025. Ocean water has uh, different uh, salts. Uh, and it has a lot of sodium ions and chloride ions and, and such. And so it's a little denser. Now, the density of the statue, I was a little uh, curious about this. If I take the 70 kilograms and uh, divide through by the volume, the statue has a density of 2,333. So it, it's not super dense. Uh, this plaster or whatever uh, is not super dense. It's surprising that it survived thousands of years uh, in the ocean, but, but there it is. Um, that's its density. Now, if the mass is 70 kilograms, then the gravitational force is 686 newtons. The buoyant force is the density of the fluid times the uh, volume of fluid that has been displaced times the gravitational field. And that's 300 newtons. So the object, the gravitational force is 686, and look, the buoyant force is supplying 300 newtons upwards. So how much do we have to lift with? Well, we don't have to lift with the 680, uh, 686. We only have to supply the difference. So 385 newtons should be enough to bring the statue to the surface. What happens when we try and lift it out? And when we lift it out of the water, into the air, almost all of that buoyant effect is going to go away. It's going to drop by a factor of 800. It's going to be a fraction of a newton. So we're getting 300 newtons of buoyant force being submerged in the water versus uh, you know, a fraction of one newton once it's in the air. So, so basically no help at all. Um, now, the tension, again, that we have to lift with is the 385. So, you know, that's something to think about here, uh, how, these fluid, how this fluid pressure uh, produces, um, how the fluid pressure uh, produces a net upward force on everything. doesn't matter what gets thrown in there. Everything's going to have a force upwards. If it's a really dense material, it's still going to sink. If it's a low-density material, it's going to end up floating because the buoyant force will be larger. And that's what they're showing here. So here is an object that floats. And what we can show is that the volume displaced, the volume below the surface, the volume of fluid that's, that's been moved out of the way, divided by the total volume of the object, depends on the density of the uh, object divided by the density of the fluid. Now, where that's coming from is this. If I have something floating, it's reached equilibrium. So something that's actually floating in the water or some other fluid, uh, the forces balance out. It's not accelerating upwards. It's not accelerating downwards. And so uh, mg can be written as the m, can be written as the density of the object times the volume times the gravitational field. Uh, the buoyant force can be written as the density of the fluid times the volume of fluid being displaced. Now that would correspond to the portion of the object below the surface. Um, and so we can take these two, set them equal to each other, cancel out the factors of g, 
And that's, that's the formula you end up with. So that's handy. Um, here's an interesting example. It says that we have a hydrometer that is able to uh, measure the density of a fluid. And it's calibrated so that at 1,000, uh, that's the density of water. This is referred to as, we, we mentioned earlier, specific gravity. So pure water would have a specific uh, gravity, it's a crazy name, uh, 1.000. And what they're saying is this little, it's a little piece of glass or something. It's been weighted at one end. We can drop it in the fluid. Um, it's a glass tube weighted at the bottom. It's 25 centimeters long, so, you know, it's pretty good size, and we're just going to drop it in whatever fluid. Um, it has a cross-sectional area of 2 square centimeters, and it has a mass of 45 grams. How should we calibrate it? What would the distance x be so that the 1.000 lines right up with the surface of the water? Notice that if the water, if the fluid, is more dense, this will be lifted farther out of the water, or out of the fluid. If the fluid is less dense, it will sink farther in, higher density, it, it pushes it out. So that's how this hydrometer is going to work. And um, here we have the buoyant force, here we have the gravitational force, and we want those to be equal. Again, this is an equilibrium situation. Uh, here is the buoyant force uh, in terms of fluid density and fluid volume. And uh, here is the mass of that object in kilograms, the gravitational force, 0.441 newtons. So uh, now what we can do is we can take uh, the formula for buoyancy and then solve for the uh, density of the fluid, uh, the density of the fluid is going to be given by uh, mass over the cross-sectional area uh, over the uh, distance x. Now, from that, because we, we cancel out the gravitational forces, from here we can now rearrange the equation and solve for x. Uh, the distance x is going to depend on the mass of the hydrometer uh, divided by its cross-sectional area divided by the density now, the fluid we're interested in here is water. So, for the density of the fluid, I am now using the density of water. And uh, everything was in grams and, and centimeters, so I just, I stuck with that. And uh, the value we came up with was uh, 22.5 uh, uh, centimeters. So, that's how we want to uh, carry out the calibration on this uh, device. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at buoyancy in the air. We've been kind of making fun of air as having not much, uh, not being able to provide uh, very much in the way of uh, buoyant forces. But uh, we clearly can build balloons and uh, lift objects into the air by using uh, the fluid pressure. So the air pressure below this balloon this balloon needs to be much bigger, right? It needs to like fill the whole room here. Uh, the fluid pressure, the air pressure below, is higher than the air pressure above. And then along the sides, the lateral forces cancel out. So it's how much force do we have up compared with how much force down. And we can use the same formulas we've been working with. So uh, those will continue to um, those will continue to work. Uh, fine. All right, um, let's see how should we set this up. So what we could do here is, uh, I'm going I'm to switch back and forth between their nice drawing and, and uh, some additional information. Uh, here's the buoyancy. This is the mass of the uh, helium. So first of all, helium experiences a gravitational force too. So the reason helium tends to rise through the air is because it's less dense. But, you know, if, if the nitrogen-oxygen atmosphere weren't here, 
the helium would sink to the ground. Gra you know, gravity, if you released a bunch of helium on the moon, the helium would sink to the ground and sit there. So uh, the helium is being pulled gravitationally. So there's a force of M1g, where M is the mass of all the helium in the balloon. Now M2 I listed as the uh, balloon and the cargo. So they said M2, they told us, M2 is 180 kilograms. So I know how many kilograms that is. Now the way this uh, force diagram works, I've got upward force is uh, buoyancy. The buoyant force is the only upward force, and that has to do with air pressure, uh, the fluid pressure. And then that's got to be able to lift against these two gravitational forces. Now for the buoyant force, um, I can write that as the density of the fluid, that's the surrounding fluid, so that's the density of air. So this is the density of air, and then the volume of air that's been displaced times the gravitational field equals M1g plus M2g. Well, all the g's cancel out. Uh, that's becoming kind of standard here, right? In many of these situations, uh, the gravitational field cancels, and that, and that says that whatever we calculate will work the same way on another planet, right? So, good to know. Um, so we'll cancel out all the g's. Uh, the mass of the helium depends on the density of the helium times the volume. So I, I substituted that in. So I, I ended up with a formula that said density of air times the volume of the balloon is equal to the density of helium also times the volume of the balloon. So the displaced air volume is basically the same thing as the volume of helium. So this volume uh, is the same. And then what's left on this side is just the mass. So I was able to solve this for the volume. I ended up saying that the volume of the balloon needs to be determined by the mass that we have to lift uh, divided through by the difference in density between the air and the helium. So, uh, so let's take a look at these fluid densities. Now, I used for air, I went down to zero Celsius, one atmosphere. Uh, the density then is 1.29. So at lower temperatures, we're going to get more density. So I, I guess that's why balloons take off in the morning, right? The temperatures are lower, the air is denser, the air has uh, actually settled. So at the lower temperature, the air has settled down closer to the surface and the, the air is denser. The molecules are not moving quite as fast. Uh, the helium density that I looked up, I don't know if this was zero Celsius, 0.1785 kilograms per cubic meter. So that's what we're working off of. The helium balloon is working off the difference between uh, air density and uh, helium density. Now, if it's a hot air balloon, there's a much smaller margin to work from. With a hot air balloon, we're heating the air inside so that its density goes down. Some of the air is, is pushed out by the fast-moving molecules. The remaining air inside is not as heavy. Um, all right, so those are the densities. Putting all the numbers in, I ended up with uh, the balloon needs to have, the helium balloon would need to have a volume of uh, 162 uh, cubic meters. And when you look at the densities too, you can't do much better than helium. I guess hydrogen is, is a little less dense, but we it, it really depends on the difference between the air density and the helium and uh, if we look, uh, the helium density is the helium density is uh, is really low compared with the air density, and now that's got me a little nervous. Uh, I'm thinking I need to go back, and um, yeah, I don't think the helium density is. No, it'd be about a factor of seven. So the air has, uh, the molar mass of the air is about seven, yeah, that works. So the air's molar mass is about seven times larger uh, than helium. Helium is monatomic. 
Um, so maybe that does work. Okay. 162 cubic meters for the um, for the volume. Now, uh, I didn't wanted to go through and see what that would mean. So uh, if I take that volume and then solve for the radius, assuming the balloon is spherical, the the, the number we had before uh, is independent of the shape of the balloon. So the 162 cubic meters will work regardless of the shape. Uh, now we're assuming a spherical shape, and that would give us 3.38 meters. Uh, I went back and, and calculated just the masses. So the, um, the air that we moved out of the balloon, the density of air times that volume, uh, gives us 209 kilograms. So what we did was we moved out 209 kilograms of air and replaced it with 29 kilograms of helium. And so um, that's where we get that extra buoyant effect. So the difference between that is the amount that we're going to be able to lift. All right. Now you might say, what if we did this? What if we completely empty the balloon? Then it wouldn't have any mass at all. Then we'd have a buoyancy of 209 kilograms. Yeah, but then the balloon would collapse. So it turns out that 28 kilograms of helium is able to produce the same pressure as 209 kilograms of air. So that's the key feature here, is the pressure inside the balloon, the pressure outside the balloon, they basically match. They're pretty similar. Uh, and so we're able to get maintain the same pressure on the balloon from the inside with a much lower mass. All right, we are ready to take a look at fluids in motion and uh, ask what's, uh, what happens when we have uh, fluid moving along. Now, as you guys probably know, you can watch water. We always come back and think about water as this uh, liquid that we're familiar with. Uh, if water is flowing very nicely, you turn on a faucet slowly and the water uh, is flowing very well behaved, uh, but if you turn that up, you end up with what's called turbulence. Uh, or if you have an object going through, you end up with turbulence. So here's some diagrams here. Uh, these are probably what? Like airplane wings? So they're playing around with airplane wings and finding out when the airplane is flying straight ahead. What does that look like versus if you tip this uh, versus the airflow? Um, you, you end up generating this turbulence. So the nice, uh, smooth uh, flowing is called laminar, and uh, the, the one with all the jumbled uh, directions is, um, is uh, turbulence. So uh, now let's think of the rate of fluid flowing through a, through a region or through a pipe or something like that. Uh, what we can say that uh, there's an equation of continuity that says that uh, the mass per time at any location equals the mass per time at another. What that's telling us is this. Um, yeah, actually this is a good diagram, so let's jump ahead to this. So I've got uh, a fluid going through a pipe. Now. The fluid is flowing in a way where it fills the pipe. It's not like a little bit of fluid running along the bottom of the pipe. This is a, a, a container or a pipe where the fluid fills um, the pipe and then it is going to be forced to go through a narrower region of the pipe. And so um, what we want to keep track of is this. If, if I pick one location here and I measure the rate at which fluid goes by, and then I measure another location here, and I measure the rate of fluid going by there. The rates have to match if we've reached some type of a steady state situation. Now what that tells us is once the steady state flow is set up, this will be traveling slower and this will be traveling faster. Uh, and that's because there's a continuity set up with a pipe that's been filled now, we're assuming that the fluid is not being compressed, so this is more like um, 
typical, this is more typical of liquids, then what we find is that area times uh, velocity equals area times velocity. They keep using uh, Greek letters here for velocity, I think. Um, maybe they need to stop doing that. Um, let's see. Oh, here we go. Here's the correct letter. That is a V. So that's a velocity here. So uh, if we're looking at flow rate and saying it's, uh, there's this continuity going on, we really have to think in terms of the mass. So the mass rate will match. Now, what happens with gases when we send uh, a gas through this tube? The gases could compress. So the gases could end up compressing, and that means they don't necessarily have to go faster. It could be the gas is more compressed here and less compressed here, maybe. So with, with liquids, though, uh, which are, are quite non-compressible, uh, what we can do is say that the density at location 1, the density at location 2, they're basically the same, and so the equation simplifies. Uh, and it simplifies down to uh, A1 V1 is equal to A2 V2. All right, so that's kind of interesting. I always think of this as being out in traffic. You know, when the freeway drops from four lanes down to three or down to two, everybody just has to go faster, right? Uh, we're going along with four lanes and everything is fairly compressed already. And then we go down to two lanes. Um, we just have to drive twice as fast, and then we'll be able to get through, okay, uh, is what this is, uh, what these formulas are suggesting. Don't really do that, okay? Don't drive twice as fast. Uh, so here's another diagram showing kind of how this flow rate works. Uh, and so what we've got here is, here is the larger cross-sectional area, and there's some speed of the fluid moving along. Here's another part of that, uh, another cross-sectional area that's smaller, and the speed's going to have to go up because the little bit of volume here, this dx times the area 1, has to equal this volume here. So the volumes have to match. Uh, we got to be able to get the same volume through um, each region uh, at, at the same rate. So uh, dv dt, uh, the dv's here, can be written as cross-sectional area uh, times dx. So we can divide that through by time. Now, if the flow rates match in both locations, um, then A1V1 equals A2V2. Now, why do we say that the flow rates have to match? Can't I have more water coming in than leaving? And you go, well, if I have more water coming in here than leaving over here, where's all the extra water going? So the idea is, again, if the pipes are filled and we're flowing this stuff along, then the speeds will have to follow this formula. They're going to have to go faster in the narrower regions. Okay, so this allows for uh, variations in density, and it reduces to this formula when, um, when we're assuming the density is fixed. Uh, the water, for example, is non-compressible. All right, here's an interesting example that we can follow up with. Uh, this is looking at the circulatory system. And what we're saying with the circulatory system here is that um, if we take the flow rate of blood leaving the heart into the aorta, then what we can do is, you know, all of these things spread out, they bifurcate, they go all these different locations, and then all the blood returns. Now, what happens to the blood is it ends up traveling through these capillaries, right? It ends up traveling through these really narrow regions where it's kind of single file. The uh, red blood cells, uh, all the blood cells, kind of go through one at a time. And that allows for the red blood cells to exchange oxygen with the, uh, with the surrounding tissue uh, efficiently. And so that's what we're, we're counting on. Now it says that if we take a look at uh, the aorta, 
the aorta has a radius of 1.2 centimeters. Well, that's like a diameter of two and a half. That's a big artery, right? So the aorta is a pretty good sized pipe with blood going through it. And it says that in the aorta, the average speed is about 40 centimeters a second. So it's moving at a good speed, uh, and it's a pretty good sized uh, tube that the blood is going through. Well, what we could do is we could take this uh, radius and convert it into an area, multiply it by the speed, and that would give us a flow rate. That would give us a flow rate of blood leaving the heart through the aorta. And then what we could do is, is uh, microscopically take a look at one of these capillaries. And what we find is that the uh, radius here, 4 times 10 to the minus 4 centimeters, um, and the blood there, again, getting out a microscope and watching this, is moving at about 5 times 10 to the minus 4. So the blood cells have really slowed down. Now, in order for the blood cells to really slow down, we have to provide a lot of cross-sectional area. Not in the individual capillary, but in the combination. So what this question is asking is, how many capillaries are there? Assuming that the blood flow from the aorta separates into some number of capillaries, and then all of those paths connect back together into some very large veins, the vena cava. Um, let's take a look at those rates. So the aorta, uh, the cross-sectional area, putting in the numbers given, gives us a 4.52 centimeter per second, the uh, centimeter squared, sorry. Uh, the velocity is 40 centimeters per second. That says that through the aorta, we have 181 cubic centimeters of blood passing each point. If I stand right next to the aorta and I, I measure how much blood is going by, it's 181 cubic centimeters every second. That's a pretty good flow rate, right? So uh, now compare that with a capillary. The cross-sectional area here was measured to be for, um, cross-sectional area uh, works out to be 5 times 10 to the minus 7 cubic, uh, square centimeters. And the velocity that we said was measured was 5 times 10 to the minus 2. So I can multiply those two numbers together. The flow rate through an individual capillary is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 8 cubic centimeters per second. Now, the aorta flow rate is equal to some number of capillary flow rates. I can take that capillary flow rate and um, multiply it by some number, and I will get the aorta flow rate. So I set it up like this. The number of capillaries is equal to the combined flow rate of all the capillaries, the aorta uh, rate, divided by individual ones. And that worked out to be uh, 7.2, 10 to the ninth capillaries. So 7.2 billion paths for the blood to take. All right. And uh, that's going to be necessary to allow oxygen exchange uh, to take place. Okay, so I like that example. That's kind of an interesting way. There's, there's no way, well, maybe there is. You could estimate it by uh, taking out a microscope and doing some careful dissections, maybe, and looking for these capillaries. Uh, this way you can just work in terms of fluid in, fluid out. Uh, it's got to match. And so uh, we can use the aorta numbers uh, and, and, and an individual capillary number to come up with uh, the number of capillaries. All right, we are going to move on to look at uh, energy conservation within a fluid. And this is actually related to something that we call uh, Bernoulli's equation. So, uh, I, you know, everybody aspires to have their equation. Bernoulli ended up with an equation. Uh, what Bernoulli's equation does is it keeps track of energy. Okay, this is kind of the stuff we've already been looking at. Uh, where the velocity of the... Oh, not, not quite. It, it's new stuff. Okay, so here's the flow rate. 
Now what happens is, when we, when we think about this, where this is wider, it's going slower. When it gets narrow, it's got to go fast. Now what that says then, is that we need to have higher pressure in this region and lower pressure where it's going fast. Because the fluid has to accelerate. We have to be pushing it more from behind than it's being opposed in the front. So the argument here goes like, the pressure here is going to be lower where the fluid is moving faster, and where the fluid is moving slower, the pressure will be higher. All right, so uh, now what we can do from that argument is say, let's think in terms of the work being done. So um, the higher pressure, the work is coming from the higher pressure region, and conservation of energy says, if I look at different locations along the, um, again, along the uh, length of the flow of the fluid, uh, what we can do is, now, uh, this is, uh, this is in terms of kinetic energies. So this is kinetic energy at point two, minus the kinetic energy at point one. Now what that's going to be uh, equal to is the difference in pressure, and then we can also bring in gravitational potential energy. So this equation, that's a little hard to see. Let's rearrange it. So the one that's highlighted here uh, says that if I look at one location and I look at all the energy at that location, that includes pressure, which is an energy density, uh, kinetic energy density, that's not mass, that's the density of the fluid, and gravitational potential energy density. Each one of the terms in the equation is an energy density. Each term has units of joules per cubic meter. So I can look at one location, add together the pressure, the kinetic energy density, the gravitational potential energy density, and then set that equal to the sum of those energies farther downstream. So I can pick a series of locations along the, the flow of the water or whatever fluid. And then I could use Bernoulli's equation to, uh, to answer questions about the velocities and the pressures and such, specifically the pressures, I guess. So let's say that we have water circulating through a house. Uh, it's a hot water heating system and the water is being pumped at a speed of 0.5 meters per second through a 4 centimeter diameter pipe. Now that's in the basement where the water heater is. And uh, it's under a pressure of three atmospheres. Now as it flows through the house, there, there is a dedicated pipe that goes up to the second floor. That pipe is 2.6 centimeters in diameter, and um, it's at a height of five meters above where the water heater is. Um, what will be the flow speed and what will be the pressure? So, so here we go. See if we can use those flow equations and then also the energy density equations. Now here's the picture I drew. Here is the water heater in the basement. Now I, I drew this backwards. I don't know why. I should have just drawn it as a loop, right? So let's just think of it as a continuous loop. Here is the water heater. Water is coming out, flowing out from the water heater, and uh, the numbers we were given is at the location of the water heater in the basement, flow speed is 0 0.50 meters per second. Uh, the diameter of the pipe is four centimeters. Uh, the pressure is three atmospheres and we're at an elevation, I'm gonna call it zero. So we'll say the, 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 the basement has a zero height to it. Now, when we move upstairs, there's a dedicated pipe that, that there's no branching or anything. This pipe just goes uh, around in a circle. At the top, it's gonna to be flowing at a different speed. I have to calculate that. Uh, at the top, the diameter of the pipe is 2.6. 
there's going to be a different pressure at the top. I have to calculate that one too. And then finally, the elevation, the height that the water gets pumped through is five meters. So I hope we have enough pressure, it says three atmospheres, to make this uh, circulation work. So there it is. So all of a sudden I'm using A and B instead of one and two? What did they use? Oh, okay, never mind. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna say at location A, uh, I've got a pressure, uh, a potential energy, and a kinetic energy, density, and then at point B, uh, the same. Pressure, potential energy, kinetic energy. Now, that's the energy equation. The other equation here is the flow rate equation, where V times A equals V times A. So this one, I can solve for VB. VB is going to be equal to VA, area A over area B. I calculated area A. Uh, I did, and I calculated area A, but then I went back and I decided just to use ratios, so I did that instead. Uh, so this is uh, velocity A. Now this is the cross-sectional area, this is the diameter. This is the cross-sectional area, that's the diameter. The pi over 4 is cancel, and so the speed at point B is the speed at A, uh, diameter A over diameter B squared. And when I put those numbers in, Ooh, I hope I squared this. I did not. Okay. All right, you guys are going to have to go back and double check these numbers. Uh, this needs to be squared. And so I can see from the answer, I don't think it is. So that velocity is going to be higher. So uh, I'll, 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 my intention right now is to go back and get this corrected um, in the notes. But let's see how this plays out. So I can solve the pressure at point B by taking the pressure at point A <clears throat> plus the difference in the kinetic energies plus the difference in potentials. Now, the densities here of the uh, water, the density of the water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, so I can use this throughout. Uh, the gravitational field, 9.80, I can use that throughout. Uh, when I calculated the kinetic energies, I ended up with, um, in the basement, the kinetic energy density, 125 joules per cubic meter. Upstairs, the kinetic energy density, 297 joules per cubic meter. So the kinetic energy densities are, they're both pretty small. They're not very significant. Now, I, I got this number... I, I, I believe this is incorrect. I'm going to have to go back and get that uh, corrected. But still, I don't think it's going to make so much of a difference. Uh, there's a small difference in energy here. Um, let's look at the potential energies. Now, that would be rho g h. And uh, there, the potential energy difference of the water upstairs is 49,000 joules per cubic meter. So... A, a few hundred joules here is going to be pretty much insignificant. So the kinetic energy differences is small and fortuitously, uh, where it looks like I made an error in the calculation, it's probably a negligible effect in any case. So um, let's get down to uh, the pressure then. So let's take, uh, now it says the pressure down below is three atmospheres. I've got to get that converted into standard units. So I multiplied the atmospheres and converted those into Pascals. Now, if you remember, a Pascal is the same thing as a joule per cubic meter. So what I'm seeing here when I go back to this top equation is that the, uh, the pressure upstairs will be 254,000 joules per cubic meter. So what's, what are the significant effects? Where are they coming from? And the pressure at the top is equal to the pressure down in the basement. That's what we started with. And the big effect was going upstairs. The big effect was uh, climbing through five meters. That reduced the pressure 
uh, by 49,000 joules per cubic meter. Okay, so that's the big effect there, that <clears throat> the kinetic energies didn't have much of an effect. Okay, but that's an example of using uh, Bernoulli's equation for these uh, types of problems. Okay, here's another example using Bernoulli's equation, using the uh, energy densities. What we can do here is, we, what we've got set up here is a tank of water, and we have an opening. We have a spigot, now it's really small. So what that's saying is the water's going to come shooting out at some high speed, but the water here is not going to be appreciably moving. It's such a big tank that the speed at which the water comes down, it's really low. So we're going to say the velocity here is approximately zero. And we're, we want to go in and calculate what the velocity is here. Now, they ended up with this formula. Let's see if we can make sense of it. What it's saying is, uh, if I look at the water coming out of the spigot, it's got a kinetic energy, one-half rho, V1 squared, a kinetic energy density, and it has, um, has a gravitation, oh, here we go, and a gravitational uh, energy, which is uh, rho g y1, the height of the spigot, and then that's equal to gravity. So what they're claiming here, let's just look at the, uh, I wrote up my own set of notes, and so let's take a look here. Uh, I want to fill in some gaps. So let's say this is point A, that's water up here, and then point B is water here, and then point C is water that is shooting out of the pipe. Now, what we can say at point A is that we have some amount of pressure at point A, and we have gravitational potential energy. We don't have much in the way of kinetic. Uh, the water is not really moving at a very high speed there. So we're going to ignore kinetic energy at point A. When we get to point B, all we really have is the pressure. What we're going to say is that we're down at... Um, here we're saying we're at a height of h, and here we're saying we're at a height of zero. Here we're saying that we have a speed of uh, approximately zero. Inside, the speed is still approximately zero. It's not until you get close to the spigot where the water begins to accelerate. All of that really slowly moving water, uh, now, uh, the combination, the combined effect of all that slowly moving water leads to uh, a small amount of water leaving at a very high speed. So uh, at point B, I really just have the pressure. And then once we come back outside, well, we're back out to the outside pressure plus the kinetic energy. Now, what we can do is we can skip point B. That was just so, it, so we could think about it conceptually. So density uh, energy at point A can be set equal to the energy density at point C, that would be uh, pressure A, which is atmospheric pressure, uh, and this would be um, also atmospheric pressure. So the pressure at A and the pressure at C, they're the same. So those also cancel out, and it says that the kinetic energy of the water coming out is density, is equal to the potential energy of the water at the top, and that gives us the same formula that they came up with. Okay. All right. Um, a couple of other conceptual examples using um, Bernoulli's equation. Here is an airplane wing. Airplane wing cross sections are designed so that the air coming up over the top of the wing ends up moving faster. It has to move faster. It's a longer distance. And so once the air, airplane is flying through the, the air, the wing is making its way through the air, this pressure drops because of the curved effect. So I have full air pressure below, but a reduced pressure above, and as a result, the plane flies. Uh, we, well, the plane has lift. This is what's providing lift, is the uh, air pressure from below the wing. You go, really? Air pressure keeps the plane in the sky, you've got these airplanes that are hundreds of tons of material, 
and the air pressure is large enough to hold them in the air. Okay, that's, that's kind of remarkable. And it's not a huge difference in pressure. You know, the shape of the wing is not going to eliminate all the air pressure from above, but it's enough that the pressure difference uh, lifts the wing up. It pushes up on the wing. Uh, baseballs, too, if you're throwing a curve. So if you spin the baseball, uh, there's a difference of relative speed as the baseball goes through the air, and it creates a higher pressure on one side, lower pressure on the other, and it pushes the baseball to the side. So these are some remarkable uh, properties. Now there's some later chapters on viscosity, uh, and we're not going to go into any detail there. Uh, just uh, say there's enough to realize that fluids have kind of this built-in friction, kind of an internal friction, we call that viscosity, and it has to do with how much the uh, atoms or molecules uh, in the fluid attract each other. Uh, here, is, here are some water droplets. As you guys know, if you look at water, uh, the water molecules are attracted to other water molecules. And as a result, water tends to form these droplets. So this is a result of uh, surface tension, the uh, attractive forces uh, between the water. And it's, it's pretty cool that you can look through these water droplets and see these upside down images. That's physics 3B. We will look at that with light. Uh, here's another great example is going over to the water and seeing uh, insects standing on the water. Now what's happening here is the water molecules are reluctant to separate. So the force holding the water molecules together provides a little bit of an up, up, upward force. If the insect is not too heavy, then it, it dents the water, but the water doesn't separate uh, and allow that uh, appendage to drop down into the water. Here's a picture of a pump. Okay, here's an intake. I, I had to include this one uh, because it, it looks like my, my, my old washing machine that I, I had to repair. Uh, this is exactly what the, the impeller looked like. Uh, there was a water intake and then this thing spinning around that would pump the water out of the washing machine, I guess. And then finally, uh, a very, very important uh, pump uh, the heart. Uh, here are the uh, ventricles, here are the atria, uh, here are all the valves, uh, and you know, kind of a description of their operation. So these are just examples um, to see where we are headed. That takes us to the last of uh, chapter 13. So uh, that wraps up chapter 13. If you guys have any questions, uh, stop by. I'm expecting there are questions. There are some challenging parts to uh, to these uh, to these chapters we're looking at.